So at the close of the last lecture, I said I wanted to talk about the kind of inverse of the Eads Bridge, a suspension structure that was not only a vital infrastructure link between two cities, uh, but also an important part of those cities' uh, civic uh, conception or civic representation. And that bridge, of course, is the Brooklyn Bridge, which was a rough contemporary uh, of the Eads Bridge, but done, of course, in very different uh, circumstances. And in a lot of ways, the Brooklyn Bridge is the story of an engineering family, uh, the Roeblings, uh, who designed and, and built it and uh, were essentially a, a, a bridge building family. The Roebling Company uh, was both an engineering and a contracting firm led initially by John Roebling, who you see on the left. Uh, when John uh, died of uh, an infection in the early stages of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, his son Washington took over. Um, Washington, as we'll see, uh, was also fated to, uh, to be uh, uh, badly uh, injured uh, on the, during the construction, and it ended up being uh, his wife, uh, Mary, who did most of the uh, job site supervision. Uh, so it's an interesting story about the family and about expertise. It's an interesting story about really one of the first women to be a, a, a civil engineer in practice, if not in name, uh, and also the, the sort of sacrifice that it took to get these large uh, infrastructural projects built. The Roeblings, as I said, were basically a suspension bridge designing family. Uh, uh, the, the father was a civil engineer uh, who worked on rail projects and developed patents for a uh, wire rope. So basically a cable that would replace the wrought iron eye bars that we've seen in the, the British suspension bridges. And they had a successful career of building uh, bridges over what had deemed, what had been seemed to be impossible uh, situations, notably the Niagara Gorge on the upper left. And this bridge is interesting for a number of reasons. As you can see, it was both a passenger uh, rail bridge and uh, a road bridge. And the, the rail, uh, as we noted when we were talking about suspension bridges in Britain, uh, puts an incredible, incredibly concentrated point load uh, onto the bridge. And, and this bridge really didn't quite work. The deflection was so great that the locomotives ended up kind of in a valley in the middle and had a hard time pulling their load uh, back up to the other side. So it was a relatively short-lived uh, functional bridge, but one that proved that the suspension concept could handle, as you can see, pretty rugged uh, terrain. Uh, they also built the Sixth Street Bridge uh, in Pittsburgh and the Cincinnati Covington Bridge uh, that you see uh, in the lower right that is very clearly a, a predecessor to the, to the Brooklyn Bridge, both in form uh, and, in, and in style. The Brooklyn Bridge uh, had the unique qualities of, first of all, being by far the longest span ever attempted uh, by any sort of bridge, uh, suspension or otherwise. It was also built in the middle of a city, and it was built in particularly bad soil. And this is sort of a, 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 a given when you're designing a bridge that goes over a, a waterway that you're going to be trying to put, you're going to try to put that bridge on the, uh, the underwater surface, which of course is going to be waterlogged uh, and therefore basically a, a fluid. Um, you would like to get the supports, especially big compression supports for a suspension bridge, uh, all the way down to bedrock. And the way this was done was uh, using what were called caisson foundations. We mentioned this briefly when we were talking about skyscraper construction, a way of getting through poor soil to get to bedrock, which might be 60 or 70 or 80 feet uh, below. And the way this was done was to basically use the weight of the tower to drive a timber uh, support through the fluid soil below with enough space, as you can see in the, uh, the drawing on the right, to allow workers to excavate uh, the soil uh, in, the, in the, the, the lower chamber. So workers would be down here excavating the soil. You can see that the caisson has essentially blades uh, around the edges that are going to help drive it down uh, through the muck. And then to keep water from infiltrating the caisson and drowning the workers, this area is pressurized and workers descend through airlocks uh, to get into to that space. As the uh, soil is excavated, the, the caisson sinks at the same time other workers 
who honestly have a slightly uh, less dangerous job, are piling stones on top. They're building the towers as the, the caisson is sinking. So the increasing weight of the tower helps drive the, the caisson down through the, uh, the river bottom um, until they reach bedrock, at which point that bottom chamber can be filled with rubble uh, and concrete. Uh, caissons were very effective, but they were also incredibly dangerous. And the pressurization in particular, uh, we know now, uh, tends to lead to decompression sickness. If people move up and down between the pressurized and, uh, and, and unpressurized atmospheres too, too quickly. And this is what happened to Washington Roebling. He got a case of decompression sickness, uh, what's also known as the Benz, uh, that essentially disabled him uh, fairly early on in the, in the process. Um, there were uh, accidents, there were injuries, there were deaths. Uh, the, the construction site on a normal project in the 1870s would have been uh, carnage enough, but on a project like this, it was a fairly frequent occurrence that, that workers would lose their, lose their lives. Once the towers were complete, once the compression structures were complete, this is where Roebling's uh, genius came in. This is where the wire rope uh, really sort of earned its keep. The way that they manufactured the rope was in place. So on the left, you can see they have uh, a, a spinning uh, piece that is uh, wrapping whatever the, the, the small cable that they've strung across at first uh, is, is, and that by continually going back and forth, wrapping that initial cable with more and more strands of wire, they build up a cable that at the end is something like two feet uh, in, in diameter. Um, you can see in the center photograph, uh, this is the, the cable, one of the cables kind of nearing completion, and you can see that it's very, very high up. Um, it will only deflect down to its final position as the deck is actually added. So this is the catenary shape that the cable assumes under its own dead load only. The deck will weigh it down and you can see where it's going to go, right? The deck is going to be level with the bottom of the kind of gothic arch shaped openings uh, in, the, in the towers. On the right, this is a, a shot from the top of one of the towers and you can see that the cable is laid over a saddle, a greased saddle that allows the cable to move to one side or the other as the loads on the deck uh, change as streetcars and, and, and traffic uh, roll over the deck. And that allows the, the deck to move a little bit, to give a little bit. It also means that the tower uh, is never put into bending. The, the force of the deck is always uh, just in compression. Uh, Roebling was faced with uh, doing uh, calculations that were honestly well beyond what the science would have uh, allowed at the time. And so there are factors of safety built into the Brooklyn Bridge that uh, give it redundancy. Uh, it is both a suspension bridge and a cable stayed bridge. And on the left, you see its famous pattern uh, of cable stays that come out of points within the towers that add a little bit of uh, stability and support to the deck. On the right, you see the finished product. Uh, there are two decks and the truss that uh, goes in between them uh, helps to stabilize the deck against wind, something that may or may not have been calculated at the time, but now we know is, is one of the big problems with these, uh, these very large bridges. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge uh, connected the two cities of Brooklyn and New York. So it was a tremendous uh, economic boom to both cities because you no longer had to rely on ferries to get back and forth. Also, of course, became a symbol of the bridge. The towers were uh, among the tallest structures uh, in, the, in the city. They loomed over most of Manhattan. Uh, and so this became a symbol of New York's kind of technological prowess. Um, and as well, the Brooklyn Bridge became a, 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 an object of interest to philosophers and critics, people wondering again about the aesthetics of industrially produced objects and industrially produced buildings. Uh, Montgomery Schuyler, one of the most important architectural critics of the late 19th century in America, uh, compared the Brooklyn Bridge to the Britannia Bridge, the, the tubular bridge that Stevenson uh, and Fairbairn had, had uh, designed and built. And Schuyler thought that Brooklyn was better for important reasons. He said that Stevenson's Britannia Bridge was the ugliest of the great bridges, um, not because it's square and straight, he said that's fine, but because it tells nothing of itself. You can't understand how the bridge works just by looking at it. It's just a, an inarticulate uh, box. 
Um, and he talks about the deck of the Brooklyn Bridge especially. He thinks the towers uh, are a little bit precious. There's no need really for the Gothic arches. Those are a bit of uh, a bit of aesthetic play or a bit of uh, ornament. But he thinks that the deck, the skeletonized structure, he says is a scientific diagram. The purity of the catenary curve of the cables, the truss work of the deck. Um, he says that even the layman can see the interplay of forces represented uh, by an abstraction of lines. And this is a, a fairly new idea that a building can speak very plainly about its engineering, about its construction, and that that can be an aesthetic experience in and of itself. We've seen plenty of buildings that uh, are sort of um, unornamented or unadorned, kind of the, the, the pure uh, structure, um, but those have, have tended to be um, industrial buildings, right? Mill buildings, uh, rail sheds, things like that. Here, Schuyler is saying that the Brooklyn Bridge is a work of architecture. It's an aesthetic uh, object, and it is because, not because it is ornamented or covered in decoration, but because we're getting connected to the basic fundamental principles uh, of structure and, uh, and, and, and construction here. Um, the interplay of forces represented by an abstraction of lines, he says, um, no other monument of architecture can speak its story more clearly and more forcibly than this gossamer architecture, this very, very lightweight uh, architecture. And he describes the, the bridge as an organism, right? There's very little uh, to the deck and cable anyway that, that, uh, that you could take away uh, and the bridge would still work. So it's, there's a kind of minimalism, there's a kind of authenticity, but there's also a kind of very direct beauty. And, and this is something new and it's something we'll see throughout the 20th century. Uh, critics especially arguing that the clearer a structure speaks about the way it works or about the way it's built, uh, the, the more authentic, the more beautiful uh, that structure is to us. The British equivalent uh, of the Brooklyn Bridge, I would argue, isn't a suspension bridge, uh, but it's a very, very uh, interesting type. In some ways, the opposite of both the Eads Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it is the, the Firth of Forth, which is uh, over a very, very large uh, ocean strait uh, in Scotland, just outside of uh, Edinburgh. Uh, it is built in the 1880s, and it is designed, again, f as a rail connection between the north of Scotland uh, and the, the, the south of Scotland. So like Brooklyn, an important economic link, but here between, again, two parts of the, of the country. There are competitions uh, held for it, and you can see on the right that uh, there are plenty of entries that, uh, that take the suspension character of the Brooklyn Bridge and try to adapt that to uh, rail lines. And these are wild, uh, they are unsuccessful, and they have the very obvious problem that a suspension bridge over a 16 or 1700 foot span is going to deflect way too much uh, to allow locomotives to, to traverse it. The Firth of Forth also takes place in the aftermath of one of the worst bridge disasters of, of the 19th century, the, the Firth of Tay collapse, which is uh, just outside of Edinburgh as well. So it's a, it's a local disaster uh, that definitely colors the way people think about bridge design and, and, uh, and makes uh, the organizers of the competition think twice uh, about awarding the, the contract for the Firth of Forth. Firth of Tay is designed and built uh, by an engineer named Thomas Bouch in 1871. And it is built uh, out of cast iron supports and wrought iron trusses. Right? So uh, according to the kind of early 19th century uh, standards, this is exactly right. The supports are in compression, the trusses are in uh, bending, and therefore wrought iron uh, is useful for bending because it can take tension. Compression is useful for supports because it uh, is reliable only in uh, compression. The bridge, however, uh, collapses, and uh, it collapses in a windstorm, and in the inquiry that follows, uh, it turns out that the cast iron uh, pillars are very suspect. They are suspect because uh, the Firth of Tay, like many straits in Scotland, experiences high wind loads, right? Big storms come through off the North Atlantic, and these bridges are subject to very, very high wind speeds. The supports, therefore, don't only work as pure columns, right? They're not only in pure compression, they're also in bending. They're acting like cantilevers that are sticking out uh, of their piers, right? Sticking up instead of sticking out, I guess. And over time, 
cast iron being unreliable in tension. Uh, it goes into bending. One side of the, the support is in tension, one side is in compression. The side that's in uh, tension ends up stretching out. And it turns out that over the, the year or so that the bridge was open before it was collapsed, uh, the, the maintenance workers had to shim connections in the, the supports because the cast iron was getting stretched out by being put into, into bending. And eventually in a windstorm with a train on one of the spans, uh, the wind treated the train basically like a sail. The, um, the dynamic load of the wind finally broke one of the cast iron supports. And as you can see, the bridge plunged into, into the water, killing a, a, a good number of people. So the type of uh, bridge with lots and lots of little supports was, uh, was uh, under suspicion, but the material was as well. And the winning entry by uh, John Fowler and Benjamin Baker uh, was not only a new type of bridge, so-called cantilever bridge, um, it was also proposed to build the entire structure in steel. And this is one of the very, very earliest applications of steel on a large scale, of industrially produced steel uh, on a large scale. Using, not surprisingly, the Bessemer process, steel is now relatively affordable for the first time. And of course, it has that quality of being uh, equally reliable, equally strong in both tension and compression. So you see the competition entry on the top, the slightly uh, more straightforward version uh, that was built below. Fowler and Baker relied on an outcrop in the middle of the firth uh, to put one of the, the towers. They put the other two towers on the shoreline on either side. And you can see that the bridge kind of springs from these three foundations. And there are equal cantilevers on either side that support the deck and then also support these smaller uh, 300 foot or so spans that are simple trusses uh, between them. Baker uh, would write that he was inspired to do this by a, a, a bridge that he saw in China, a, a version of which you see on the left. You can see that the stone uh, spans in this case are cantilevered out from each bank and then there's a small simply supported span sort of dropped in the middle. And on the right this very famous uh, recreation of the, the bridge principles uh, done with uh, bricks and cricket bats. And you can see that the two gentlemen uh, who have their arms out, they're holding the cricket bats, which are the compression elements uh, of the cantilevers. Their arms are, are doing the work of uh, tension. The gentleman in the middle represents uh, the simple span. And so long as you uh, weigh down each one of the cantilevers, right, treating them like a, a seesaw, um, and so long as the gentleman's arms are, and uh, the, the cricket bats are strong enough, uh, you can have a, a, a stable uh, bridge uh, in equilibrium. More importantly, if you uh, balance out the construction process, build equal amounts of bridge at the same time uh, going in both directions, um, you need uh, relatively little scaffolding because the bridge can be self-supporting as it grows outward uh, toward its, its neighbors. Um, you can see on the left a construction photo where I think you get very clearly the, the cantilevered nature uh, of the bridge. And on the right, you can see not only the, the kind of basic uh, way that they have trussed the cantilever section, but you can see too the difference between elements of the truss, cords of the truss, that are in compression versus those that are in tension. The compression elements, the diagonals that are in compression are the solid, heavier ones bigger pieces because they're worried about uh, buckling. The lighter pieces going the other way are done in lattices. They can do this because they are only in tension. They're not worried about buckling. When you're pulling on something, uh, you only have to worry about the, the material failing. You don't need to worry about it uh, bending and sort of getting out of the way of the, of the load. And so, you know, as per Schuyler's discussion of the Brooklyn Bridge, there is here too a very, very clear expression uh, of the way the bridge works, the mechanics of the structure of the bridge that I would argue we find, we tend to find inherently either pleasing or at the very least uh, reassuring. The detailing uh, of the bridge in particular uh, shows, shows this, right? It displays the kind of uh, difference uh, in, in the way that the elements are performing. And then if you look at the cross section of the bridge, it also 
uh, understands the, the lesson of the, of the Firth of Tay disaster, that this bridge is not only going to be subject to gravity loads, but it's going to be subject to very intense wind loads. And so these cantilevered towers all kind of splay out at the base, giving the bridge a, a wider footprint that lets it build up a resisting bending moment uh, when the wind tries to treat it like a sail uh, and, and, and push it over. Um, the Firth of Forth Bridge was at first controversial. Not everyone thought that steel uh, would be reliable. They were worried about uh, corrosion in particular. Um, it took eight years to design and build, uh, but finally opened and was proof of concept not only for cantilevered bridges themselves, uh, but also for steel as a product. And, and this was basically a demonstration product or project for the, the new British steel uh, industry and proved the point that steel was reliable, that it could be maintained, uh, that it could stand up even in the harshest of environments. Uh, and here, of course, you have marine air, salt air that, that is notorious for attacking uh, metal, corroding, uh, corroding metal. Across the channel uh, in France, there is a singular figure uh, who develops many of these ideas along very, very different lines. Um, Gustav Eiffel is uh, known, of course, for his tower, which we'll certainly get to, uh, but he was originally, uh, and probably uh, most importantly in some ways, uh, a bridge engineer. Um, he was trained as an engineer not at the Ecole Polytechnique, which was the, the sort of um, the highest end engineering school in Paris, but instead at the somewhat less prestigious but much more practical Ecole Centrale. And interestingly enough, while he was at the Ecole Centrale, uh, a year or two behind him was William LeBaron Jenny, who had come from the United States uh, to study as an engineer, uh, would go back and work both first as, the, as an engineer in the Civil War and then of course would go on to Chicago uh, and develop some of the, the city's early skyscrapers there. We don't know if Eiffel and Jenny had much interaction, but it's tempting to think that they at least met, uh, met in passing, right? two of the, of the great uh, iron and steel engineers of the 19th century. Um, Eiffel, uh, out of school, went to work uh, for a railway company. Uh, he was basically a site engineer for a cast iron bridge in Bordeaux uh, around 1860. Um, and his own career uh, developed very, very uh, quickly. He designed uh, a 38 meter wrought iron uh, arch structure uh, for a machinery hall at the Paris Exhibition, one of these knock-on uh, exhibits after the Crystal Palace, uh, and parlayed that into a, a successful business building iron buildings uh, in Paris in the 1860s, 1870s, so while the, the, the Brooklyn Bridge uh, is going on. Also in the 1870s, though, uh, he uh, was uh, employed as a, as a bridge designer, uh, bridge constructor, and he built four rail viaducts as the, the French rail system began to spread through more, more and more difficult uh, territory. The Massif Central uh, is a mountainous region in France that required uh, an awful lot of tunnels and bridges to get these very shallow grades that, that locomotives uh, required. Um, we'll look briefly at the Duro uh, River Bridge, 1875, so exactly during the, the time that the Brooklyn is being built. And then maybe his most famous bridge, the Garabi Viaduct uh, in saint Fleur, which um, was 165 meters. Uh, but as you'll as we'll see, uh, was uh, uh, one of the most striking bridges architecturally uh, that was built in Europe at the time. Um, and then in 1885, uh, in a competition for uh, another world exposition to be held in Paris, um, he proposes basically uh, one piece of the bridges that he's been building, but blown up uh, to gargantuan scale. And this is based on a, a, a cartoon, a sketch, maybe even done in jest by an engineer uh, in Eiffel's office. This becomes uh, his most famous work. So here are uh, a couple shots of the sort of viaducts he was building in the Massif Central, uh, the, right around the end of the 1870s. And you can see that they are trusses up on uh, wrought and cast iron uh, supports. And uh, Eiffel uh, had this intuition about wind forces being important. So you can see that the, the supports splay out toward the base. And then as they come down to the, uh, to the pier that is their foundation, you get these dramatic curving members that are basically adding resisting moments to the, to the, uh, to the towers themselves. 
So solving some of the issues uh, in the Tay Bridge by using a combination of wrought uh, and cast iron, uh, but also understanding that the shape of the pylons was going to be important uh, in resisting wind uh, as well. The Douro River Bridge in Portugal, this became uh, Eiffel's kind of uh, signature form, uh, a crescent-shaped arch. So uh, an arch that is thicker in the middle that comes down to pin connections at the base. The logic behind this is that even though it is a, an arch, it's going to be almost entirely in compression, that it is going to take some bending as trains uh, go over it. And therefore, you want to treat the arch uh, as sort of 90% an arch and 10% as a beam. And a beam, of course, simply supported beam, wants to be thicker in the middle, deeper in the middle uh, than at the ends. The pin connections also serve as a kind of structural fuse. They prevent any bending from getting transferred into the foundations, right? Trying to bend the foundations or twist the foundations uh, out of the ground. And then you can see that uh, the supports between the foundations, the arch and the deck above are these pylons that are wedge shape, right? That, that, that uh, splay out as they come down to the ground, a, a, a perfect wind resisting shape because the cantilever is deepest at its root and therefore is gonna be able to most easily build up uh, the, 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 the most uh, resisting moment. And we'll see the shape again and again. This of course is the shape uh, that the, the Hancock in Chicago uh, is famous for. Um, Theophil Serig, an engineer in Eiffel's office, uh, argued for the, the crescent um, that, uh, that because A, it would simplify the calculations, right? Easier to, to do the discrete calculations for pin connections than the hyperstatic calculations for fixed uh, connections. And he says also that it would be uh, most suitable for load carrying, right? That it works a little bit in bending, mostly in compression, uh, but also the most graceful. And this becomes important for Eiffel, that it is not only uh, a set of bridges that are strong, it is a set of bridges that look strong and convey again the, the scientific principles that, that Montgomery Schuyler thought uh, were so important and also so resonant with our own sense of, of beauty. Um, Garabee is probably uh, Eiffel's best known bridge. It is way out uh, in rural France. And so one of these bridges that had to be brought piecemeal uh, to the site. And it too, like Douro, is a, a, a crescent shaped bridge that comes down to two pin connections. So easy to calculate, easy on the foundations, uh, and appropriate for a, a form that's gonna take both compression and, and a little bit of bending. You can see the, again, the, the splayed out uh, towers. And then in construction, we have uh, sort of these tantalizing construction photos uh, of the bridge actually being built. And you can see that very much like Eads, the arches, uh, are built out from the foundations, suspended from the, um, the, the deck above. They meet in the middle, and then the decks get built both from the pylons and from the center of the arch. So the bridge essentially grows out of its foundations uh, and out of its decks. So those pylons should look familiar, right? They are uh, sort of foreshadowing of uh, Eiffel's uh, most renowned work, the, the, the so-called Eiffel Tower, or as it's called by Parisians when it goes up, the Great Eyesore. It's remarkably unpopular uh, given what a symbol it's become uh, of the city. And Eiffel in proposing that he basically take one of these pylons and blow it up three or four times uh, the, the size, um, his, his proposal is that this is an inherently beautiful form, that when you get up to heights of 100 meters, 200 meters, or in the Eiffel Tower's case, 300 meters, wind is such a determining factor that it basically gives you the form. And it's a form that uh, we inherently recognize, right? We have all been in a windstorm where we've spread our feet out to try to gain some purchase on the, on the ground below. And he, Eiffel argues for this not only as a pragmatic solution, but also as a, as a beautiful one. Um, the first principle of architectural beauty, he says, is that the essential lines of construction be determined by an appropriate to its use, by an appropriateness to its use. The Eiffel Tower's function is basically to resist wind, right? There are elevators in it that bring people up to the top, but it's not like a skyscraper, there's no office floors. It's literally just keeping those people safe uh, and, and preventing them from getting motion sickness from the, from the structure moving around too much. So if wind is the one thing that you're solving, Eiffel says, 
then the form of the building and its expression ought to be all about that. And he says that uh, an enormous base narrowing toward the top is not only functional, but it will give a great impression of strength and beauty. We want buildings that not only are strong, but that look strong. And here, uh, this uh, early sketch uh, by someone in, in uh, Eiffel's office, uh, you can see we'd like to think anyway that Eiffel himself on the right realizes that this would be as tall as Notre Dame and the Statue of Liberty uh, and the obelisk in uh, Place de la Concorde and a triumphal arch and all of these other things like stacked up on top of one another, right? It's a, it's a sketch you can imagine being a, a subject of great discussion uh, in the office. But it's also a structure that actually was built and that relied on what uh, Eiffel had learned building these railroad bridges about uh, both uh, prefabrication, the structure is all in wrought iron, not in steel, uh, at least originally. Um, those uh, wrought iron elements were all manufactured uh, outside of Paris. They built a freight depot right next to the site so that the train cars could come in with this constant flow of, of wrought iron pieces. And as you see on the left, Eiffel pioneered these climbing cranes that basically uh, raised themselves up the tower while lifting pieces uh, in, into place. On the right, you see the, the kind of announcement of what Eiffel uh, intended to do. Uh, and in the middle, you see the, the construction itself. And it is uh, composed of all of these lattice girders that um, perform both the, 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 the tensile and the compression uh, forces. Because the wind can come from any direction, they have to be designed all for both tension uh, and compression. In wrought iron, though, uh, they are reliable uh, in, 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 both, uh, in both, both modes. The tower is uh, critiqued for many reasons. Parisians at first hate it because it uh, is such an imposition on the skyline. They, of course, come to love it. Uh, architectural critics look at uh, certain details that Eiffel has employed or, or been required to employ, in particular, these big arches uh, that connect the legs at the base and that have no structural purpose uh, whatsoever. Um, some look at those as clouding the, the reading of the actual true uh, structural nature or lateral resistant nature uh, of the tower. Um, others can ignore that. They see those as grace notes to the overall uh, form. And uh, the, the great 20th century critic Roland Barthes, not usually one we would think of as uh, being kind of a uh, scientific determinist, uh, says that the results of all of Eiffel's calculations are a great Baroque dream, um, which touches, he says, on the borders of the irrational, right? So a very, very rational process that somehow touches our spirit, uh, our emotions in ways that, that we can't uh, quite explain. Architecture, Barth says, is always dream and function, uh, expression of a utopia and an instrument of convenience. So this is engineering raised to such a height that again, it becomes almost a kind of spiritual uh, practice. And interestingly, uh, going against uh, Telford, right? We talked in the last segment about how uh, there's this uh, British tradition of empiricism. Uh, knowledge only comes through experience versus continental, what's called rationalism. Uh, knowledge can come to us most efficiently through just sitting back and, and thinking about things. And Eiffel, interestingly enough, is fully on the continental side. He is 100% uh, uh, a theorist. He critiques the English engineers of the 19th century, going all the way back to Telford, by saying that uh, they do their dimensions not by calculations, but by trial and error uh, and, and, uh, and models. Um, English are ahead of us in their practice, uh, but the French have surpassed them by far in theory uh, to create methods which open up a sure path to progress, right? In other words, if all you do is go out and look at what's worked, you can never have the big dramatic leaps of thought uh, that give you something like the, like the Eiffel Tower. And he argues that theory lets you calculate and lets you eventually come up with structures that are lighter and stronger than those that are built before. The truth, of course, is that all of these engineers are doing both, right? They are sitting back and, and theorizing or, or coming up with uh, ideas that they think are going to be better. They're putting some of those ideas into practice and seeing how they work. They're coming back and letting the theory and the experience kind of bounce off one another, right? To see what worked, to see what didn't, to see what might be better. Um, there are syntheses that have to happen, especially in structures that are this big, where you think about both uh, 
the theory and the kind of nuts and bolts uh, and try to try to integrate them. Uh, when we come back in the third portion of the lecture, uh, we will look at both uh, a, a figure that we've seen before, Robo Mariart, who designs bridges in concrete, another material uh, that, that has uses in both building and, and, and long span bridges. And then we'll look at a particular kind of genealogy of American bridge design uh, after Brooklyn, after Eads, that takes those principles and adapts them to both new uh, uses, but also uh, new, uh, new materials.